Good morning. morning. Open your Bibles, please, to Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2. So happy that you're out this morning. Happy to see visitors. I'm always happy to see our teenagers being so engaged with our lessons and taking notes and singing songs and participating in the worship service. Folks like Gage, just wonderful young men. And our brother Brody, who will be preaching soon. And Jesse, wherever Jesse's sitting today, preaching in a couple of weeks. Just great. I know, and I'm embarrassing you just mentioning your name, and you'll probably say, don't ever call my name from the pulpit again. But I'm, I'm proud of you, and that's why I'm doing that. Just great young men, and young ladies, I won't mention your names either. Uh, but I, I'm very, very proud of, of the young folks in this church. And I'm sorry that I did not meet the previous generations. They have come through here and gone out into the community and they are members of other congregations and are contributing to those churches. But I have a great feeling and a good respect for those that are here that will be leaving eventually and going to school and that you will be a part of a congregation wherever you might be. I know that you'll be contributing to those churches from what I see here. I'm very proud of you. In Habakkuk chapter 2, or chapter 1 rather, in verse 1, the minor prophet in verse 2 begins a prayer that I think he regretted praying after he prayed it. Have you ever prayed a prayer that you regretted praying? Habakkuk begins in verse 2, How long, O Lord, will I call for help, and you will not hear me? I cry out to you violence, and yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises, and therefore the law is ignored and justice is never upheld, for the wicked, around surround, or the wicked surround the righteous, and therefore justice comes out perverted. You see, here Habakkuk is saying to God, there's so much wickedness among the congregation. There's so, much ter- so many terrible things going in the congregation. I can't stand it. My eyes can't even look at the church because there's so many terrible and wicked people. There's lying and cheating and stealing. There's all sorts of addictions and you don't do anything, God. All you're doing is sitting up in heaven on your throne with your arms crossed. You're doing nothing. How much longer do I, the righteous prophet, have to sit here and look at this unrighteousness? Habakkuk wasn't expecting God's answer. And God answers in verse 5 and he says, Look among the nations and observe. Be astonished and wonder. Because I am doing something in your days that you would not believe if you were told. In other words, God says to Habakkuk, While you thought that I was doing nothing, I've been working on a plan to punish the Israelites. To punish the congregation." That if someone had told you what my plan is, you wouldn't believe it. And I'm raising up the Chaldeans, yes, that vicious people who have no regard for life, who don't care if you're a woman or a man, or or if you're a child sucking on your mother's breast. I'm raising up that nation to destroy, to punish my children. These are the people that would take their enemies and while they're alive, impale them with the stake. Just to see them squirm. These are the people that would come swooping down on their horses and grab a child by their ankles, swing them up in the air and find the nearest rock and crush their skulls to see their brains just scatter. Yeah, 
That's the people that I'm raising up to destroy or to punish the congregation. You want me to go on, Habakkuk? And then Habakkuk answers and he says, Oh no, verse 12. Oh no, you're not from everlasting. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We will not die. You, O Lord, have appointed them to judge. And you, O Rock, have established them to correct. Habakkuk says, God, hold on a minute. I, 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 I wasn't... I, I, I didn't mean for you to, to go to that extreme. And the point that I want us to think about this morning is that we need to be careful what we ask for in our prayers. And sometimes we, we just, sometimes we, we, we flippantly say things in our prayers to God and we need to be careful what we say and what we ask for because God just might answer those prayers. There are different types of prayers. There are safe prayers. For example, the prayer of thanksgiving. And that's the type of prayer that, that you say, Lord, I thank you for this day, for the food. This is a, a type of prayer that does not require anything from me on my part. I'm, I'm simply thanking God for the good things that he's given me. I'm simply thanking God for the clothes on my back, for the house that I live in, for the bed that I sleep in. I'm, I'm, I'm thanking God for his goodness and the blessings toward mankind in general. This is a prayer that reminds us of being grateful. But it doesn't demand change on my part, you see. It's an easy prayer. And then there's those prayers of blessings. Lord, please bless this food we're about to eat. Again, this prayer does not require anything on our part. There's no commitment from me. I'm, I'm just saying thank you. I'm, 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 I'm asking God to do something for me. This is a type of prayer that, that our comfort zone is not molested at all. It's not bothered at all. Just thank you. And then there's the recited prayer. You know, the, the prayers that are often handed out on cards, like the Hallmark cards. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep and I should die. And should I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Bless my mother, bless my father, my sister, my brother and rover. Now this is a type of prayer that is effortless. It doesn't require commitment on my part. It's simply something that I recite every night. Someone wrote on a, on a message board and asked, I, I'm new to this Christianity bit, and I would prefer an effortless prayer to recite every evening ahead uh, of me going to sleep. Please, can someone, a fellow Christian, help me with this or inform me of a prayer? Maybe the Our Father who art in heaven or, or something simple because I just don't know how to pray. And then the, there are those that I call the dangerous prayers. This is a prayer where we place ourselves in the hands of God. And this is where a prayer, a prayer where we say, God, use me however you want. I am yours. This is a prayer that requires me to change, to submit to God's will, to accept whatever change is necessary. And this is why I say it's dangerous. Someone once said that prayer is the anvil upon which we beat our will into the will of God. Where our will does not continue to be our will, but it becomes God's will. So in this lesson, I want us to talk about four dangerous prayers. Extremely dangerous prayers. I mean, really dangerous prayers. The first one is in Matthew chapter 28. It's, it's not a prayer that we actually say but a prayer that we do. And that's the day that we become Christians. In Matthew chapter 28, and verse 18, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me both in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And notice this. Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now this business of teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you. 
When we come out of the watery grave, once we become Christians and we've come out of the watery grave, what we're saying to God is this, I give you my life. I exchange my life for yours. I mean, I, I, I might not know what that means, but as I learn more, you're going to get more of it. You know, the baptism symbolizes our death. Baptism symbolizes that we're burying the person that has been dead in sin and is resurrecting as a new child, a new creation in Christ. To walk in the footsteps of Christ. To be molded in Christ and to be molded by Christ to be Christ-like. We're placed into Christ because it's an action of surrender. It is an action of I'm giving up myself and giving up of myself to be more like Jesus. And this is why it's a dangerous prayer when we become a Christian. Because we're saying it's no more me, but it's all God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 the Apostle Paul said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new cre creature. The old things passed away and behold, new things have come. If anyone is, is, is in Christ, he is a new creature or new creation. This is dangerous to our relationships. This is dangerous to our jobs. This is dangerous to a number of things because we are marching to a drummer that most of the world cannot hear the drum beat. We're different. This means that now as a Christian, I might have to leave things behind. I might have to give up my friends. I might have to give up my relationships that I hold so dear and near. Because in Christ, I have to love the world less to love God more. Another dangerous prayer in Luke chapter 22 and verse 42 is the one that says, let not my will be done but yours. Have you ever prayed that? That maybe you're, you're experiencing some type of hardship in your life. And you're pouring out your, your soul and your heart and your mind to God in prayer. That you might even be, be shedding tears as you're praying to God. Asking Him for a job. Asking Him for, for a resolution to whatever problem it might be. Whether it might be health or, or financial or, or familiar or whatever it might be. And you end that prayer by saying, but God I understand and I accept let your will be done and not mine. Do you know what that means? Have you taken a sober look at those words? Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said those words. He said these words after he had a conversation with Moses and Elijah on Mount Transfiguration. When they came to talk to him about his impending death on the cross. And then he's in the garden of Gethsemane. He's left his friends at the entrance to the garden and says to them, I want you to stand watch, to hold the vigil and pray for me. He goes off to, by himself and he prays and he's praying about this crucifixion. And he says, Father, if you're willing, if there's any other way, I don't want to die on the cross. If you're willing, remove this cup from me. Yet I, re I resign myself. That your will will be done and not mine. Whatever you decide in the end, Father, I accept that. And what did the Father decide? 
that Jesus would be handed over by the hands of cruel and godless Jews into the hands of cruel and godless Romans and crucified on the cross. And this is why I say to you, when we say to God, let not my will be done but yours, that's a dangerous prayer. One often ignores the impact of this phrase. And when the Lord Jesus said this prayer, he was willing to accept the outcome. When we say this prayer, I assure you that things will change in our lives. This prayer brought pain to Jesus. And it will, be, and it will bring change to your life as well. Change is painful. Change was painful for Jesus. But yet it was necessary, was it not? In order for God's plan of salvation, for his scheme of redemption to, to take place, in order for all to be drawn to him, in order for you and I to, to be saved, it was necessary that he die on the cross. A cruel death. It was necessary. All of our choice, choices are now based on God's will and not mine when we become a Christian. Not my will, but yours be done is dangerous because it requires a lot on my part. It requires a lot. It's more than now I lay down, now I lay myself down to sleep or however that prayer goes. It, it requires more than, Lord, thank you for this food that I'm about to eat. It requires more than saying, please bless my, my mother, my father, my brother, my sister, and spot. This really requires change and acceptance for whatever God's going to send my way. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7. The third dangerous prayer is when the Apostle Paul said, whatever things were gained to me, I now consider as rubbish. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish or dung, so that I may gain Christ. When the Apostle Paul said that he lost everything or counted everything as a loss, we're talking about a man who held a high position among the Jewish community and possibly was wealthy and possibly was, was, possibly was even referring to losing his family. But he said, all that I count as loss. Just for the privilege of knowing Jesus. Just so that I could know Jesus. Consider all things that were treasured. And very near and dear to me, Paul says, I have exchanged it for the surpassing knowledge of knowing Jesus the Christ. The nature of the passage demands that we recognize that there are many things that we'll have to give up in order to be Christ-like. We'll have to give those things up. Everything, when placed on the ledger sheet, is rubbish and not worth it. It's an accounting passage, if you will. In comparison to knowing Jesus. In verse 9 he says. Lord do whatever it takes to make me like Jesus. Because I value knowing Jesus and being like him. More than anything in this world. In Romans chapter 5. And verse 3. And not only this. But we also exult in our tribulations. Knowing that tribulation brings about peace. To say this, this nonverbal prayer. That I count everything as loss. Or as rubbish. For exchanging it to know Jesus. It means that we will have the character of Christ. And how does Jesus teach us character? Through tribulations. Just as he says there in Romans 5. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20. 
For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure, with it, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. That you'll suffer for doing what is right. For standing up for Christ. For standing up for your brother and sister. For standing up for the cross of Christ. For the gospel. You'll suffer for that. Because you prayed the prayer that you count everything as rubbish for knowing Christ. And finally, in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 13. When Paul says, through whom the world has been crucified and I to the world. He says in verse 13. For those who are circumcised do not even keep the law of themselves. But they desire to have you circumcised so that you may boast in your flesh. But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Why was Jesus crucified? Why, why did he die on the cross? To forgive our sins. Through his death he reached all mankind with the hope of salvation. That's why he did it. So when we say Galatians 6... Verses 13 through 14 as a prayer. When we consider Galatians 6, 13 through 14. What I'm saying is I'll do whatever it takes even to the point of going to the cross. If it means reaching people with the good news. We're saying make me effective. And some of you might know that the tradition says. That when Peter, Peter's time came to die. They offered to crucify him. And he said, I don't want to be crucified like Christ. Crucify me upside down. And that he, like the other, like many other apostles, died a gruesome death. All because of preaching the gospel. Of being a Christian, a follower of Christ. Our commitment to the Lord is to such a degree... And this is why people lay down their lives in other countries. I think Benjamin might have mentioned it in his sermon this morning. That we might not ever be persecuted to the degree that folks in the first century were for being Christians. Don't, don't take that to the bank. We might. But maybe not in our lifetime. This is why people lay down their lives to go to dangerous places. To preach the gospel. Because they've made a commitment. To serve the Lord. Our prayers are dangerous. When we pray like God commanded us. Let us be aware of our actions. Let us be aware of what we say to God. When we pray. Let us not pray flippantly. Because God does answer prayers. He'll answer them always. Be careful how you pray. Our Lord Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he prayed, Lord, let your will be done and not mine, respected God's answer when he was taken to the cross and nailed there so that you and I could one day confess that Jesus is the Son of the living God and make up our minds that we need to repent and not continue living on in sin and be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. If you're subject to that invitation and you need to make things right in your life, why not do so now as together we stand and sing? There's a fountain